there we go. All right, so the outline uh, of, of this session um, is, um, uh, so we, we will go through uh, an introduction on, on US grant strategy. We'll talk in general about uh, US-China competition. And then we will look more specifically uh, at competition uh, in the Indo-Pacific, the Western Pacific, um, Central Asia, and we will also look at the responses um, from the Obama and Trump administration uh, to the rise of China. So we will talk about uh, the so-called, the famous uh, pivot to Asia before uh, some conclusion. Uh, first of all, uh, I just wanted to start with uh, some anecdotes. Um, um, Throughout my studies, I've never, I've never worked with, with uh, intelligence studies. I've never been concerned with, with spying and that sort of things. But I have to say that over the last year, and, and particularly since uh, I've been looking more and more at China, uh, the, the, the word spy, the word intelligence uh, came up uh, quite often uh, in my experience. So um, I've met people who, who I thought um, might have been spies. Uh, I was accused to be a spy. Um, uh, chatting to other people, I was told that somebody else's um, at, at some events I attended might have been uh, a spy. And so, you know, um, at some point, all these all these um, events got, got me got me to think, what's going on? Uh, and my view is that we are kind of moving towards um, some, some form of some kind of new Cold War. Certainly, we are in the kind of general mood that we are entering uh, a, a, a new era for US-China competition, a, a new Cold War. In my view, and this is my thesis uh, for this lecture, um, I think we need to understand, first of all, how uh, US grand strategy works in order to then, to then understand why China has become such an issue uh, for US foreign policy makers and why we're entering this era of uh, new uh, Cold War. So first of all, when we talk about U US grand strategy, uh, we hear scholars uh, using mainly two concepts. One is the concept of hegemony and the other is the concept of empire. Normally scholars who uh, talk about, uh, who define US grand, uh, American power as an hegemony, uh, they highlight uh, the, the role of the dollars, but also the role of uh, alliances like NATO. Uh, and so, and, and, and therefore, hegemony effect de facto means uh, indirect rule. Um, when we talk about empire, we think more, more obviously about uh, American military assets around the world, but also the fact that the United States still controls nowadays islands in the Caribbean and uh, in the Pacific. Uh, regardless of whether you think the US is an empire or an hegemony, uh, in my view, I think it's, uh, we, we should talk of uh, something like a global sphere of influence. It sounds like a very academic concept, very abstract, but essentially means that since the end of World War II, the United States managed to promote uh, a global order, a, a form of globalization, organized around uh, its own uh, interest, especially its own uh, industrial interest. Um, very simply, this international order is based on free market rule of law. Um, effectively, and, and, and this, is, this is an international order where free, co free competition, uh, economic competition is encouraged. And this was very convenient at the time, at the end of World War II for the United States, because the United States used to have, and probably in certain ways still has, the most uh, competitive uh, economy. Um, however, this kind of grand strategy, this sort of global sphere of influence or this US-sponsored uh, globalization contains some very important limitations, especially one in particular. The, the, the liberal international order or the US-led globalization cannot work, cannot function if other countries do not follow the same kind of path taken by the United States. So if, if other countries do not uh, promote, do not uh, accept, uh, do not incorporate uh, competitive cap capitalism, technological competition, there is not a world economy, essentially. And this is a limitation because the United States, by spreading the global uh, liberal order, 
effectively has encouraged, has allowed some countries, has, has put some other countries in the condition of uh, becoming very competitive to the point that nowadays they are competing with American power. And so they are a problem for the United States. When I'm talking about um, countries uh, imitating well, so undertaking a similar path to the one of the United States, I'm thinking um, specifically about three countries. These are uh, Germany, Japan, and China. First of all, Germany and Japan in the 80s. Uh, for those of you who, who will remember that, um, sorry, for those of you who, who don't remember that, um, they have become so, had become so competitive competitive that the United States had to call a very important summit, the Plaza Accords, where uh, the US president, Ronald Reagan, uh, man, had to impose, literally impose a devaluation of the dollar against uh, the Deutsche Mark and the yen in order to make sure that the US economy was becoming again competitive uh, towards uh, Germany and Japan, which were two, two technological powerhouses, and so they were very competitive. Uh, the, the, the case of Japanese uh, car maker is actually one of the most uh, famous of the most important. Um, however, at the time for the United States, it was fairly simple, relatively simple to deal with Japan and Germany, two countries which since the end of World War II had given up any military aspiration, any geostrategic aspiration. Even though uh, we know that at, at the moment, uh, Japan's military policy is changing, but at the time that was uh, this, the, the, that was the case. However, unfortunately for the United States, um, uh, the rise of China is, is a very different uh, issue. Um, and this is a very different issue, not only because China is uh, a, a much, you know, much bigger economy, uh, but, most, but in particular because the, between the US and China over the last few decades, uh, the, 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 there has been an increasingly uh, interdependent, interdependent um, economic relationship. And, and this has led to a terrific dilemma uh, for US policymakers, which is not easy to, uh, to resolve. So on the one hand, I like to argue, on the one hand, um, the United States and China are best friends. They are strategic partners. But on the other hand, they are the worst enemies. They are best friends, they are strategic partners, because uh, first of all, as, as we all know, the China owns uh, the American uh, debt, which is very important for daily uh, economic operations in the US. But above all, China, by, by virtue of being an economic powerhouse, it's acting as a world locomotive, a world economic uh, locomotive. And so it allows that global sphere of influence of the United States, it allows that global order, the liberal international order, um, to function. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't, we wouldn't see, without China, we, we, we could never see a successful uh, American uh, grand strategy, a successful uh, globalization. Uh, on the other hand, uh, China and the US are uh, their worst enemy. First of all, because the United, China has been uh, constructing, has been building its economic, economic success uh, by becoming increasingly competitive in high-tech industries and all those sectors that are uh, considered in the United States highly strategic, all those sectors like the Silicon Valley, the internet, robotics, IT, and so on, all those sectors that uh, are the signatures industries for the United States that have made the United States great, the, the world leader. And this is a problem for, for Washington. Another problem is that in Washington's view, uh, the United, uh, China is not complying with, uh, not always complying with WTO, World Trade Organization rules. So in a way, China is cheating to the extent that it's not respecting those rules that, that the United States had established at, at the end of uh, World War II. Last but not least, China is, uh, while, while competing economically with the US, China has been growing revisionist geopolitical ambitions, ambitions in one of the most strategic uh, regions in the world, probably over the last few years, uh, the most strategic region, which is uh, the South China Sea, and more broadly speaking, uh, the, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, 
apology uh, for that delay. And so, uh, well, the United States is taking the rise of China extremely seriously, even though with a degree of delay, uh, uh, and we will talk about it uh, later on. Um, China, as we know, has been growing at an amazing, a terrific uh, speed over the last um, three, three decades and a half. Um, on average, it has been growing 10%. Uh, its GDP has been growing 10% every year. Imagine that economists believe that uh, for, for, a, for a normal country, for a normal healthy economy, uh, you know, three, a 3% GDP growth is a good pace, is a good rate of growth, but is also a very ambitious one. As you know, um, only the United States, even in the pre-coronavirus world era, only the United States was growing at, at that pace. None, none, none is capable of doing that in Europe. So at the moment, so China's growth is, is extremely remarkable. And this is an, an interesting data for us because this economic power has been translating in uh, uh, military power uh, over the last couple of decades. So uh, just to make a comparison, um, over the last 20 years, the American GDP has been growing, has been doubling and um, the military spending uh, in, the, in the United States has also uh, doubled roughly. Um, instead, the Chinese GDP over the last 20 years has been growing by 12 times, but its military spending has been, has been growing by 20 times. And so this hasn't gone unnoticed in Washington, and in a way this reminds of um, what, what happened during World War I, when uh, Britain, the hegemon, was, was, was feeling challenged by uh, the, the growth of uh, military spendings of Germany, and in particular by the fact that uh, German naval power uh, was increasing, was, uh, was improving. And China, as you can see, is, has not been growing uh, only uh, in terms of quantity. China has not been uh, spending uh, Spending, sp spending on uh, investing on um, military quantity. China has also been uh, investing in uh, military quality, especially over the ten, the last ten and five years. Uh, China has been investing in uh, for fourth generation assets like jet fighters and submarines, um, but but also um, missiles, short range and long range missiles that are crucial for its A2 AD anti access. Uh, uh, area denial uh, operational strategy, which, uh, which, which is a big issue, which is a big problem for the United States in, in the South China Sea, as we will discuss in, in a few minutes. And okay, somebody might still think that uh, the United States is largely outspending China, and this is absolutely true. The United States spends every year uh, especially with uh, Trump's budget, with the latest budget, about 738 uh, billion. Um, however, th there are two points to make here. First of all, uh, the United States, with, with, that, bu with that budget, uh, is trying to patrol the whole globe, or, or most of it. Meanwhile, China is spending uh, only uh, 250 billion per year, but its focus is mostly on its domestic region and theaters uh, and the South China Sea, of course. But also China uh, is capable of uh, producing at a cheaper cost or is, is buying its military assets from Russia. And so uh, although, although the United States is spending three times what, what China is spending, uh, China is able to make a better value of, of, of better value for money uh, out of uh, its uh, military budget, and, and and the main concern, the main issue for the United States here is that uh, most of Chinese uh, assets are concerned in that uh, critical, in that uh, crucial uh, region, which is the Western Pacific. Let's have a, a, a more specifically a look at uh, the, what's going on in the, in the Indo-Pacific region, but we will have to uh, sep talk separately about the Western Pacific and then the Indian Ocean. Uh, in general, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the United States has realized that uh, its, its, its primacy, the primacy that it used to enjoy during the Cold War, cannot be taken uh, for granted anymore. 
Um, and this is because Washington uh, is facing uh, a, a crisis of strategic uh, insolvency. Uh, essentially, the United States over the last, since the end of the Cold War, especially because of its, uh, of its strategy uh, uh, of enlargement uh, since Bill Clinton, if you remember, the slogan was from containment to enlar enlargement. Uh, since then, uh, the United States uh, has struggled to, uh, to match its military, uh, its geopolitical ends, its grand strategic ends with its uh, military assets, with its uh, military uh, means. Uh, let's have a look at why. First of all, uh, readiness uh, fell to dangerous levels. And this, as you can imagine, is, uh, is mostly a consequence of, of the money, of the energies, of the trillions of dollars that were spent, that were invested uh, in the war on terror, and more specifically uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, the second reason is uh, the budget uh, reduction that has happened on most years uh, of the Obama uh, administration. There were important uh, cuts. Um, and then third, there is a, a kind of intellectual problem here. There, is a cert there was um, intellectually, uh, grand strategically, uh, an underinvestment in interstate competition. So, Hybrid warfare uh, appeared to be uh, the main concern for, for the US and more widely uh, across the West. Um, we, have realized, we are realizing nowadays, if, if we read uh, Obama's national security strategy of uh, 2015, or if we read um, Trump's national security strategy uh, of uh, 2018, uh, that this is not the case anymore, that the, the wind is changing, that um, China, first of all, but also Russia, have become, again, a key concern uh, for Washington's uh, policymakers. Uh, linked to this 2.3, linked to the, to the lack of uh, grand strategic vision, uh, there is point four. So there was a, uh, a great investment in uh, liberal order uh, building. And, and my mind here goes back to the Clinton administration. What happened during the Clinton administration? Uh, there was a great effort to make sure that China, to convince China to, to accept uh, some, some, some rules in order to uh, enter the World Trade Organization. So to open up what I was calling earlier on at the beginning of this lecture, um, the American global sphere of influence, to, to make the liberal international order bigger, more inclusive, more productive, uh, in, uh, financially speaking. Uh, but obviously, uh, when um, comes the end of the Clinton administration and the, the, the new Bush administration was realizing that uh, the US, the United States had been losing uh, time, that they had, they had overlooked uh, the rise of China. Um, not everyone knows that there was some kind of uh, pivot to Asia being planned during the, the early stage of the, the Bush administration. Uh, but, uh, mostly because of 9-11, uh, the, the rise of China uh, was, wasn't, a, wasn't a priority anymore for the Bush administration until the very end of it. And so it was Obama who then uh, um, uh, st started again this, this endeavor of, of pivoting to Asia and trying to uh, contain China. And, and yes, so the United States believe, what the United States think of China is that uh, the United, that China is trying to uh, push the United States out of the Indo-Pacific, is trying to achieve uh, regional hegemony in the short term. Um, I agree with that, if, especially if we think about uh, the South China Sea and the Western Pacific, because these are uh, uh, crucial, uh, critical regions uh, for China. I'm not so sure about uh, another point coming from the United States, which is that China is seeking to displace the United States uh, on a global uh, stage. I think even if that was the case, we're really, really far uh, from that. And we, we will talk about it uh, later on. What instead might be more concerning for the United States uh, is the fact that China is, uh, trying, to, uh, is, is trying to promote a, some kind of geoeconomic engineering, uh, which essentially means trying to uh, propose other countries, different states agree, uh, trade agreements, which do not strictly follow um, the, the, 
again, the, the, the rules of the, of the liberal international orders, the rules of the global uh, sphere of influence. So China is trying to promote uh, uh, trade agreements like the RC, for example, uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership, which have uh, China, uh, China friendly rules as opposed to US friendly rules. Um, but of course, uh, behind, as we look at the Western Pacific, East Asia and the Western Pacific, uh, behind, uh, rule, behind the battle of rules, there are uh, military muscles. Uh, we will talk about it in a few minutes. Uh, why the South China Sea, why the Western Pacific and, and especially the South China Sea are so uh, important? Uh, these are, uh, uh, these are well-known uh, data, but I think it's important uh, for, for us to, to remind it. 25% uh, of world shipping, 25% uh, of trade uh, passes through uh, the South China Sea. Uh, $5 trillion per annum, annum in trade. Of these $5 trillion, one trillion and a half uh, is, is American essentially. So the United States has direct stakes on one, tri one trillion and a half uh, of the trade passing through uh, the South China Sea. 30% uh, of global oil travels through the South China Sea, but also there have been different evaluation, different uh, assessments, but it is believed that there might be 11 billion barrels of oil uh, available uh, under the South China Sea probably a little less, probably a little more, also depending on what the, the future technologies of oil extraction uh, will be. Yes, uh, so why, uh, why the United States, why Washington, it's so concerned, um, it's, so, it's so scared, uh, it's so worried about uh, the South China Sea, about uh, the Western uh, Pacific. China has been developing uh, technologies which uh, allow, allow Beijing to, to limit the freedom of maneuver of the United States and its allies. This is not only uh, because of the geographical advantage of China, but this is also um, mostly due to uh, China's um, new generations, uh, short range and medium range uh, missiles. Essentially, chi essentially, China is able um, to, to master the space that uh, the space within the first chain of island. So the space that goes through uh, the south of Japan, through, through Japan's Ryukyu Islands, Taiwan, the Philippines, and, 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 the, and, and those islands that are, and, and the contested islands in, in, the, in the South China Sea. So essentially, the United States believes that China would be able to, to, to win a short-term conflict in that area. Uh, that China would be able to create a fa what, what the military call a fair complete, which means that, which means that China would be able to create a situation where it would be too costly for the United States to, to change uh, the balance of power in, in that region. Um, th this is an issue also because uh, for the United States, uh, it would take uh, quite a long time to reach the theater for, 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 for more military assets, more military, US military forces to reach the theaters. Again, there are different, different assessments here, but it is believed that uh, it might take for, um, for, for, ship, for US ships uh, based in Hawaii at least one week to reach the theater and it might take about uh, three weeks uh, for, um, uh, for a carrier with, with the whole strike group uh, to reach the theater from uh, San Diego. And so the argument is that, the concern is that the United States may have to even to fight just to get into the fight in that space within uh, the first uh, uh, island chain. So uh, there have been different studies with regard to, to how the United States may, may cope with, with, the, with that, may cope with this uh, initial uh, disadvantage. Uh, it is believed that the United States may adopt a two-layer uh, strategy based, based on the fact that um, China will not uh, take, uh, will only, in the near future, will only take uh, actions that are uh, below the threshold. So uh, the first layer of this strategy, it's the resilient layer. So this essentially entails um, degrading the lane or the nine uh, 
uh, the, the China, the, the space he wants to, he wants to obtain, it wants to con control, to conquer. Uh, and and the, the resilient layer will be eventually followed by the surge uh, layer, which is essentially waiting for uh, allies, waiting for a, a larger force uh, to reach the theater and eventually to, to tilt, tilt the balance uh, in the South China Sea or the Western uh, or the East China Sea. However, uh, I always like uh, this dilemma uh, from uh, Patrick Porter, uh, which is the omelette dilemma. Um, I'm not sure if uh, all of you are familiar with that. Um, essentially, uh, the ham omelette dilemma uh, suggests that it refers to the fact that um, a chicken to make an omelette just need to, uh, only needs to, 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 to land some eggs. But the pig, to make the ham omelette, needs to commit its life. So in this situation, in the South China Sea, uh, China is the pig, while the US is the chicken. So the stakes for China are really, really high. So this is about survival for China. So it is also believed that China would fight a conflict in the South China Sea uh, to the teeth. It's a matter of survival, and Chinese elite would be able to, to get to to get all the consensus, all the support that they need uh, from, their from their population. I think it's questionable whether uh, Amer the Americans uh, would be happy to, to, to endorse their government uh, in, in that kind of uh, scenario. On the other hand, it's good to remind that uh, China, uh, China is also facing its own omelette dilemma. Uh, there have been different studies, different simulations about how China may, may attack Taiwan. And clearly, while we all know that China, if China wanted, could literally destroy Taiwan, uh, we know that Taiwan has been developing a new military doctrine, which is based on guerrilla at sea, and, which, and whose aim is to, to make uh, any attempt of Chinese invasion uh, politically costly for China in order, in order to, to prevent that. So we have, been, we have been looking at the situation, at the balance of power between uh, China and the United States in the Western Pacific, specifically in the, in the South China Sea. Uh, let's now have a look at what's the situation in, in the Indian Ocean, because we tend to talk about the Indo-Pacific as, as, as a monolith, as, as an area where, as, as if they were the same region, but actually we are, we are looking at two different regions and we're looking at two very different scenarios. So again, just a few um, important facts about the, the Indian Ocean, which we will need for the rest of the presentation. 80% um, of world trade travels through the Indian Ocean. Um, but most importantly, 90% of Japanese and South Korean oil travels there, but also 80% of Chinese oil, even though we know that a good part of the Chinese economy is, um, is, is uh, relies on carbon, but still China is, uh, th there's, there's about, that 80% of Chinese oil, it's almost half of uh, China, the, the energy that China uh, needs, needs uh, to function. So uh, the balance of power, as I was telling you, is, is very different in the, in the Indian Ocean, the, essentially for one reason, if, China, if in the South China Sea, China has a, a great geographical advantage, mainly due to the fact that we are talking about uh, narrow spaces there, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the same reason, uh, for the geography of the, of the Indian Ocean, China is, is, is up, it's suffering in, in this area, essentially because it's, it's struggle, it doesn't have the necessary military sustainment, the, the forward-based uh, kind of logistic that a great power needs uh, in, uh, in such a, 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 a broad uh, and op region with that kind of open space. Um, let, if we, again, if we compare the assets of the US and China in the Indian Ocean, we see that um, China is only uh, a, a military base in, in Djibouti, while the United States not only is in Djibouti with more than 4,000 troops, 4,000 personnel, but it also has uh, the, the naval assets in uh, in, in the Arab Sea, in, in Bahrain, um, naval assets from the Fifth Fleet, but also naval assets from CENTCOM. 
and the United States also have access to uh, the, the British territory in the, in the Indian Ocean, Ocean of, of, of Diego Garcia, in, in the islands uh, south of uh, India. Uh, and speaking of India, uh, well, the United States uh, has, uh, India has several bases uh, throughout uh, the Indian Ocean. And of course, we know that there is NATO there, there are allies. So the, the, the situation is quite, it's quite complex um, for China. And this is why uh, I argue, I believe that China will, uh, in the short term, will never take any aggressive action uh, in the South China Sea because uh, they know that uh, the United States, India, Western ally will be able to retaliate in the Indian Ocean. And, and there is very little uh, China uh, can do there. Um, there is, Ch China obviously has been investing in some very uh, strategic ports uh, in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh, in Myanmar, uh, but also in, in Pakistan. And, and many people have called that a, uh, as part, the, has seen those, in, those investments in deep water ports uh, in South Asia as part of the, of the string of pearls uh, strategy. So basically China's attempt to create its own uh, forward-based um, infrastructure. However, at this stage, uh, it, it's unclear whether these this, this, this infrastructures, these ports will act as uh, military assets for China. Uh, all I know is that uh, every government, so Myanmar, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, um, and Sri Lanka have been uh, have publicly stated that they are not hosting any uh, Chinese uh, military assets. Although a counter argument is that uh, they are hosting their own national military assets. So one day they might be able to help China in any uh, military endeavor uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we, we'll have to wait, we'll have to see. However, uh, China, um, it's trying to fix that problem in the, South, in the Indian Ocean. It's trying to uh, go out there with its uh, military assets, especially because it needs to uh, protect its uh, Belt and Road Initiative, as every great power uh, did with, with its own trade uh, over the, the last few centuries. So China has been developing um, a blue water navy. So they have, they have moved, moved away from uh, a doctrine of sea denial and and littoral warfare, and they actually they actually invest they're actually investing more in a Mahanian uh, approach to naval power, so sea control as opposed to uh, sea denial. They are doing so we, at this at this stage with two um, commissioned um, aircraft carriers, uh, with bigger amphibious uh, assault ships, and there are more air aircraft carriers on on their ways. I've seen uh, occasionally I see different numbers. Uh, I don't think over the next 10 years it will be more than four overall, but um, I mean, who, who knows? Uh, but realistically, I think China will have soon two more um, uh, aircraft uh, carriers, which will provide that uh, logistic base that China needs, needs uh, across the Indian Ocean. Uh, very briefly, let's consider Central Asia, but in particular uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, because it's linked to the balance of power uh, in, the, in, in the Indian Ocean. Um, obviously, we could, we could sit here and talk about the Belt and Road Initiative um, for ages. This is a, a huge project uh, to the point that it's a pluribillionaire project, it's transcontinental, in its aspiration. Um, it's, it's so big to the point that sometimes I wonder whether Belt and Road Initiative means anything at all because it's a, it's a label that is nowadays, it has become a buzzword, it is widely used, but Belt and Road Initiative uh, is the umbrella to hundreds and hundreds uh, of infrastructural uh, projects. But apart from that, um, the, the main, I think the, the key question here for everyone is, is this a, um, an economic project? Is this a project uh, for uh, connectivity or connectography as Parag Khan, uh, the successful author, uh, would call it? Or is this a military project, a project that uh, hides uh, more, um, more important geopolitical uh, aspirations? Um, I think 
if we look at it in the short term, we can we can mostly we can only we probably we can only see um, e economic interest, uh, and we can also see in the short term when look when look at it through through the lenses of economic interest, uh, we can see in the Belt and Road Initiative a weakness of China. Uh, China, like any other uh, fast developing economy, uh, has been accumulating. Uh, has, has been over accumulating um, uh, merchandise, uh, you know, all sorts of products that China uh, that are made in China, but also has been accumulating uh, financial uh, capital. And we know that if products are not exported, are not sold, and if capitals are not invested, uh, this can lead to uh, to, to, a cri to a financial crisis. Uh, and, and Chinese elite are very aware of that. And this is actually, uh, in my view, the essence of the Belt and Road Initiative, escaping the overaccumulation, overcapacity, overproduction trap by exporting, by allowing Chinese industry uh, to export more and more. And this is also a chance for China to develop its, its uh, Western uh, region, a, 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 a poor region which were nonetheless uh, millions and millions of people uh, live. And this is part of the uh, domestic side or domestic facet of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is often called uh, the Go West strategy. Instead, uh, so this, this is for what we consider the Belt and Road Initiative in the short term. In the longer term, but we're really talking uh, uh, quite a few years down the line, I wouldn't be able to quantify, but maybe 20 years, probably even longer than that. Uh, there might be, there, there probably are uh, some uh, you know, geopolitical aspirations. Um, in my view, there are two geopolitical, uh, two probably three strategic interests here. First of all, for China, it's, it's crucial to develop, de developing those Asian infrastructures is crucial because it would allow China to rely less on the Indian Ocean for its export and imports, for its import of oils and export of its products. And, and, and this, would be, this would be amazing for China because this would allow China not to, not to have to invest so much militarily in the Indian Ocean, not to have to compete militarily with the United States. So uh, uh, ports, uh, ports like Wadar in, in Pakistan and, and the related economic corridors and infrastructures are necessary to bypass um, the Indian Ocean. Um, a second very important point, in my view, is uh, increasing influence in, the, in, uh, in, in European strategic infrastructure over European trade. If you look at intra-regional trade, uh, the, 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 fl the flow, uh, the, the, the two regions where between we, among which uh, trade is, is the highest in the world is uh, it's, uh, are Europe and Asia. So Eurasian trade is, is, is uh, from the point of view of inter-regional inter trade, is, is the highest in the world. Uh, and, and we are seeing that um, the belt, with the Belt and Road Initiative, China has been investing in very, very strategic um, uh, very strategic uh, commercial infrastructures uh, in, in Europe. Actually, I would argue these are, these are, as you can see from my arrows, these are the access points uh, for trade in Europe. So first of all, in, in, in Germany, at the top of this picture, you can see uh, Duisburg, uh, which is where most of uh, Eurasian trade, uh, Eurasian imports come in and Eurasia, Eurasian exports uh, travel to travel from, uh, but also most importantly, uh, the Piraeus port in the south of Greece, um, several ports in Italy, in Sicily, in Gen Genoa, in Venice, but also very interesting, uh, very interesting, China is uh, building uh, infrastructures such as uh, uh, trains and, and ports in Israel. Those infrastructures might allow China, as you can see from the map, to bypass uh, the Suez Canal. So let, let me be clear, at this stage, uh, there's nothing there uh, geopolitically and militarily relevant. However, as you can see from the map, uh, 20 years down the line, we, we, that, that could be, this, could be, uh, uh, this could be represent a very, very important asset, uh, geopolitical asset uh, for China. Uh, 
so I would like to talk to, to take you through the final part of this webinar of this lecture uh, and would like to talk about the US pivot to Asia because um, China essentially is pursuing its own its own strategy in my view China is not really concerned about the United States they have their own domestic concerns they have their economic concern as I've been explaining uh, but it's the United States who need to do something about China because going back to what I was explaining earlier on about the global sphere of influence and U.S. grand strategy. If China rises technologically, if the United States loses its technological primacy, it will also lose its uh, global uh, leadership. And so uh, the United States has been doing something uh, about it. Uh, first of all, with Obama's uh, pivot to Asia, and secondly, with uh, Trump's uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. These are, uh, from a strategic point of view, from a grand strategic point of view, there is a lot of continuity between Obama and Trump's foreign policy. Um, however, there is a lot of tactical changes. What, what do I mean by this? Um, the strategic long-term objective is the same. The way this objective is pursued, it's, at times it can be, it can be uh, fairly different. Uh, we can see this clearly with regard to the to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, as opposed to the tariffs. The Trans-Pacific Partnership was a multilateral framework that um, somehow, by establishing new regional rules, sought to um, contain China. And, the, and this framework, and above all, it sought to, to impose on China some free market discipline, because essentially it was saying to China, if you want to uh, make trade, do trade in Asia, or with our partners, you need to privatize your state-owned enterprises. State-owned enterprises are really represent the, the strength, the core of Chinese power. So the US, is Obama was trying to convince China to uh, start a domestic reform, essentially. Um, Trump's tariffs are doing exactly the same. The strategic objective is the same. If you read um, the, the US, um, if you read um, um, statements from US policymakers, their concern is about protecting the strategic industries of the United States. However, Trump is not a globalist like Obama, he's a nationalist, and so he preferred to, uh, also for elector electoral reasons, I think he preferred to uh, uh, in intervene against China by using a more confrontational uh, approach, the tariffs. In terms of military, from a military point of view, Obama started the rebalance, so nowadays the United States has 60% of its forces uh, in, in the, Indo, in the Asia, in Asia Pacific and 40% in the Atlantic um, of its naval forces. Um, Trump, is, is, Trump, Trump agree, agrees with that, he's in continuity with that, but differently from Obama, he will try, he has already authorized an increase, in an absolute increase in military assets, not just a redistribution, but he has authorized the production of more, uh, of more uh, naval assets. Um, we don't know whether they, the United States will be able to, to reach the, the objective of 355 ships. Uh, last but not least, Obama's pivot to Asia was uh, presented with a very romantic narrative, which was also uh, linking to uh, Obama's, uh, the fact that Obama uh, was born in Hawaii uh, and, and uh, his life experience, the fact that he, he's, he's a, a, he was a black president, um, Trump, Trump, Trump's uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, the, the, the kind of identity, the kind of discourse, the kind of narrative that Trump is using is much more confrontational. Essentially, Trump is saying, we do not, we do not accept empires in the Indo-Pacific. So we don't accept uh, geopolitical, China's geopolitic, geopolitical revisions. And this also is interesting because it goes back to when the United States was born. And when the United, and it goes back to a very important theme in, in the narrative of Manifest Destiny, uh, when the United States was telling Europe in the uh, 17th and 18th century, look, we are different from you because you are a monarchy, you are imperialist, we are a democratic republic. So Trump is going back to the narrative, that narrative, and he's using it uh, against China. <clears throat> um, I, don't, I, I will try to speed up a little because I'm taking uh, qu quite a lot of time here and I want to leave some space for questions. Um, the United States will need its allies uh, to deal with China in, in the Indo-Pacific. 
and both Trump and Obama have been investing a lot uh, with, with trips to Asia, uh, with, with um, joint statements, with, with speech uh, delivered to in different countries, um, especially in India and Japan. India, every geopolitical analyst agree that it can make the difference in a situation of US-China competition because it's, it's the third most power, powerful actor in the region. However, there are a lot of debates in India with regard to whether um, New Delhi should pursue um, strategic autonomy or whether it should side with the United States. Uh, we don't have an answer yet to, to what India will do. I have to say that in the past, uh, Prime Minister Modi was very kind in his statement. Uh, he was very kind to China. On the other hand, India recently has confirmed his participation in the, in the quadrilateral uh, alliance, which sees Japan, Australia, India, and the United States uh, coming together in what really seems an alliance to encircle, to contain China. Japan, co contrary to India, is a very faithful US ally, so no doubt Japan will support the United States. However, Japan is a problematic ally because, it, as, as I told you before, it sits within the first chain of islands, so it's vulnerable to a, a AD tech, Chinese A2AD technology. But also, uh, Japan has its own issues with other US allies, for, with, exa with example, with for example, with uh, South uh, Korea, there are historical animosities and uh, territorial uh, disputes. And also, this is a reminder for us that, especially when we talk about Asia, the Asia Pacific, that regional order is not all about US China competition. There are very important issues. Um, and and there is, there is a, my, my sense is that the region is becoming increasingly. Uh, multipolarized. And so it's not just about US and China, there is much more to that. Um, in conclusion, um, yes, so why, why I've put uh, this, this picture on, on my PowerPoint um, and why this is related to US allies. China is investing a lot around the world, as you know from, as we know from the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, this means that uh, countries are interested, and also U.S. allies are interested in, in, in making uh, trade with China. Uh, they find it increasingly uh, beneficial, and so we are getting into a situation where historical allies of the United States, like Australia, uh, the United Kingdom, Italy, Germany, Israel, and many other, we, we could literally count every country here, they, uh, they are struggling they find increasingly difficult to tell Beijing, to tell China, no, don't do this, I don't want that, or, to, or not to endorse, or not to, uh, um, sorry, or to, they find difficult to oppose, to criticize uh, Chinese uh, actions that are not, uh, the, the, the Washington uh, doesn't like. Um, well, and, and this goes back to the fact that the United States is mostly an hegemony and that for many decades it has been, um, uh, it has been, uh, uh, it has adopted this kind of in, in, indirect, uh, of, of this kind of rule by consent, consensus, so indirect rule. And so that means that the United States is very influential in countries like the UK, like Italy, in Western Europe, but it cannot always uh, impose its own, uh, its own interests, its own wills on, on, on the decisions uh, of these countries. And so it will be very interesting to see at what point uh, and whether it, whether it will happen that uh, some or any of these countries will, will geopolitically uh, shift, will, will, go, will move closer to Beijing and far away uh, from Washington. I just wanted to conclude this lecture with uh, these um, slides on, on the Cold War. I started the lecture by saying that this is a, a, a new Cold War. Another reason why uh, I was, I'm thinking about the Cold War is it, this is not just because of, of the, the general mood, because there, there, are, there is a lot of tension. It's not just about spies and intelligence. Uh, Something that got me to think a lot is, is what we've seen with Huawei and COVID, two very different issues, and two, and two issues with our re which really are not geopolitical at all. One is about a, a, a pandemic, a virus. The other is about uh, investments in, uh, in 5G. 
And yet, these two countries have been fighting over these two issues, especially uh, the United States with regard to Huawei, but also um, China with regard to, to COVID, where we have seen a, a battle of narrative between um, Washington and, and, and Beijing. So to conclude, my, my sense is that uh, this is a new Cold War because it's everywhere. It's in the South China Sea, it's, in, it's, it's a battle for rules inside the World Trade Organization. It's a battle for uh, intelligence, cyber, when it comes to Huawei. It's a battle for narratives when it comes to the coronavirus. And who knows, who knows what, what, will come next, what will come next? Who knows what will come in the future? But uh, my sense is that this competition will increasingly define uh, the way uh, many other countries will approach uh, contemporary geopolitical issues and also uh, issues that will arise in the future. And I would like to stop here. Before I stop, I just would like to remind you that um, there will be a, uh, another webinar uh, next June. It will be free. It will be about the US pivot to Asia, uh, more, uh, that will, I will analyze more in depth. And we, and we will look at um, post-Cold War U.S. grand strategy towards China from Clinton to Trump. And there will be other uh, webinars uh, going on from September 2020 to September 2021. We'll, we'll look at th theories of geopolitics, uh, the history and the conceptualization of U.S. grand strategy, but also the crisis of the liberal international order and the changing geopolitical order after um, uh, 2008. Um, okay, uh, that, that was me. Thanks a lot for listening to, to this uh, long, long discussion. And, and I'm, I'm keen on reading your questions. Uh, please, uh, please, can you, can you um, uh, write it in the chat? If, uh, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you, Zeno, for, uh, uh, for the presentation. Listen, uh, I do have a question uh, for you, given everything you said, right? Um, do you think that uh, this uh, pandemia is going to have a major, major impact on Chinese soft power, not just in Asia, as broadly defined, but also in, uh, in Europe, right? I mean, you were... Uh, you have mentioned uh, that a number of countries are kind of shifting east, right? Yeah. So do you think that would, uh, I know that it's very difficult to predict yeah. what is going to happen, but, you know, given everything that you said, what, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen? Yeah. Does, China, does China have a plan? They don't? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, okay. So f f first of all, um, I'm trying to gather my, gather my first uh, thoughts. So I guess, first of all, it depends on how long this crisis will last. Because let's say if uh, in October we have a, 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 a vaccine, uh, it, you know, I think everything to an extent will go back to normal and we might even forget about it at some point. So it really depends on how long uh, the, the pandemic crisis uh, will last. It depends on whether this virus uh, will mutate. Um, I, think, I think that's key. And this is key also because soft power is something that you measure in the long term, in my view. This is not like uh, hard power, which is something, um, it's something extremely tangible, extremely uh, visible that everyone understands. Uh, soft power is more about uh, perceptions, and perception needs some time to mature. Uh, you mentioned um, the, the, the whether China is a strategy. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative of China is a... Uh, sorry, can, can I ask... Um, close... Uh, in, in, yes, thanks, the mic, thanks. Uh, China, uh, within the Belt and Road Initiative, I was explaining earlier on, which is this very broad umbrella, launch a, a, a health strategy. 
Uh, I don't think it was particularly uh, developed until the, the, the coronavirus uh, outbreak. I think it was mostly uh, mostly slogan, or if you want, mostly a grand strategic objective. But um, so I think we're still far, far from that. However, there might be an acceleration with the coronavirus. Uh, uh, last but not least, I think uh, Chinese investment are really key to, to increase uh, China's soft power, even even before. Uh, even even more than than the than the pandemic. I mean, especially in Europe, uh, we are a continent where which we are facing a, a big crisis. Even you know, even before this pandemic, we were not doing really well. And uh, so you know, people appreciate investments uh, ca coming in, and so that, that's a very important element for for China's uh, soft power. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, so listen, we have a question uh, from Michele Luppi, Tom Carter, Mike Smith, and Paul Maynard. Please, uh, um, uh, people, go ahead and unmute your mic, uh, I mean, so that you can ask Zeno uh, your question. Uh, so, uh, Michele Luppi, uh, we can start from you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, first thank of all, you. thank you. Thank you for this amazing lecture. I learned a lot, especially about uh, um, Israel. I didn't know China had infrastructural project in Israel. Um, but uh, my question is about Russia specifically. You talked about a new Cold War. And, uh, you know, one, one of the major elements, let's say, of the Cold War was trilateral diplomacy. Uh, or triangular, sorry, diplomacy between uh, Russia, China and the US. Yeah. And how the US was able to... Uh, to play, let's say, with this division, with this, yeah. with, the, with the conflict within, uh, between these two powers, between these two superpowers. Um, well, Russia is surely playing a role in this confrontation, uh, whether uh, is it or not in the Southeast Pacific, but uh, how it is specifically playing a role in this yeah. confrontation? Yeah, th thank you very much. Um, f first of all, given that you uh, that we discussed the Asia Pacific, I forgot to add that uh, yes, in the Indo Pacific and in the Western Pacific, of course, the U.S. has a lot of military assets, but there are not only the U.S., China, and its uh, U.S. allies. There is also Russia, and this is a concern uh, for the United States. That's why um, uh, uh, naval people expert in uh, naval affairs they believe that. Obama's rebalance is not enough. It's not about <clears throat> just about redistributing. The U.S. needs to increase its naval assets. So, and, th and then you get uh, Trump coming in with its idea, his idea of uh, building more ships. So, uh, triangular diplomacy: U.S., Russia, and China. With regard to China and Russia, I think what we have seen in, in recent years is that. There is a very healthy, very productive cooperation in terms of uh, gas, in terms of uh, military training. Um, however, I think that's as far as it goes in the sense that uh, I don't see the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization as a future NATO. I don't think they will ever be in a formal military alliance. Uh, I think, I think I've think i seen many arguments. The one I like the most is that they agree on many areas, China and, and Russia, but they don't have, they have different, they don't have a, a shared uh, view with regard to the, to the world order, to the, to the international order. And so they don't have a, a, a final, a, a similar objective. They don't, they don't share a, a final end state as for example, it was with, with NATO, NATO allies. Uh, during the Cold War. Uh, with regard to US and Russia, uh, I would like to know more about that, but my, uh, my, what I found out during my PhD is that uh, definitely both Obama and Trump, uh, in, the, in very different ways, Obama with the reset, Trump by talking to Putin as if he, they were friends, they've I think that the US have tried, at least the White House has tried to reapproach uh, Russia. I don't know enough about the Pentagon in the sense that I don't think there is, if there is a plan with regard to that, it's classified. But from a grand strategic point of view, it makes sense for the US to uh, reapproach uh, Russia. Uh, I think there is quite a lot of opposition <clears throat> inside the Pentagon. I think the Pentagon, or many people in the Pentagon, are still in some kind of uh, Cold War uh, 
uh, old-fashioned um, uh, mindset. Uh, I think, but I think things might change. So if China becomes more and more a priority for the US, the attitude of the US establishment, of the military establishment towards Russia may change more, more and more. That, that, that's, that's how I see it. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thank you very much. Uh, listen, Tom, uh, please go ahead, uh, unmute yourself, uh, and, and you can ask Zeno the question. Cheers, Michele. Thanks, Zeno. Um, yeah, I just want to know Trump's recent rhetoric as being playing to his base or more of the same or perhaps a ratcheting up of his rhetoric against China and where you thought that might lead. So, sorry, um, it, it was breaking up. So uh, you're asking me um, where Trump's rhetoric uh, might lead. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, that, I mean that, that's an interesting question in the sense that, um, so before I was talking about the uh, strategic continuity and tactical differences between Obama and Trump. So they have the same objectives, of course, but Trump has a different ways of implementing those. And, and an element of in this, in this different tactical approach is the fact that he's very confrontational, uh, sometimes uh, very arrogant. Uh, sometimes, uh, I, I, uh, don't take me wrong, I really understand from an American point of view the perspective of why US policymakers are concerned about uh, Chinese industries, the Silicon Valley and so on. It, it makes sense to me. But anyway, so Trump has this very confrontational approach. As you said, he, he confirmed that uh, with the coronavirus outbreak. Um, if Trump was president forever, for life, I think that, would, that might have led to uh, miscalculations, to, to further tensions between the US and China. I wonder whether as soon as Trump goes, uh, we, will be, we will go back to a more uh, accommodating, a more diplomatic kind of uh, rhetoric. But anyway, we, we have seen it even with the, with the tariffs, uh, with Trump's tariff. Uh, China, China was quite, seemed to be, uh, they, they got their own issues, but they seem to be quite relaxed about it. So it tells me that they're playing a long game and they are not so concerned with regard to, to Trump's rhetoric. So I don't think, just to be brutally simple, I don't think the way he speaks, whether about the tariffs, about the coronavirus, about Huawei, should, should lead to a, a conflict between the US and China in the, long, in the short term. That, that's my view. <clears throat> Gustav, uh, Mike. Uh, Mike, please go, go ahead. Thanks very much. Um, I was just wondering how much you think that the One Belt, One Road initiative and other economic initiatives from China will actually be able to overcome the middle income trap for the masses of the Chinese population that remain at a very, if not absolute poverty, then a very low income level. And if the current ones will not, what new initiatives we might see in the future from China? Okay, in terms of new initiatives, I think, um, <clears throat> I, think, I think this is just about uh, branding and rebranding. So whatever they might call it in the future, it will always be about a grand strategy based on trying to overcome that uh, overaccumulation and overcapacity uh, trap. Uh, I mean, that, that's a very economic, very uh, technical uh, <clears throat> question. I, I, I'm not sure about the answer. Uh, all I can say is that uh, I remember that in uh, uh, late 2019, economists was, were very much concerned because China was slowing down. And they were saying that uh, if it was going down from 6.3, 6.5 to 5.5 or to 5% 5, 5 of GDP growth, that would have been a, a big issue for China. Um, I think before seeing any middle income trap, what we might see is that uh, the start of, um, if the CCP was unable to deliver on its economic objective, we might see the start of social, uh, social discontent. 
Um, and so the, this might lead, I'm, I'm, I'm talking very much long term here, but this might lead to some domestic political reform in order to, to, to reabsorb, that, reabsorb that kind of discontent. Uh, so I don't know, it, it might be that before that middle income trap, we will start to see some protest and some attempt by the CCP to, uh, to shape that, to, to, to make that, uh, that discontent uh, softer, less, less frightening, less threatening. Uh, Paul Maynard, please go ahead if you, if you want. Hello, uh, Connell Maynard. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, hi. Yes. Zeno, I can hear you. Yes. Hey, Zeno. Uh, thanks very much uh, for your presentation. Fascinating. Um, so, so my the, the thing that really stood out to me was uh, the figures that you presented on China's GD, GDP growth over the over the last period, which was around about you know times twelve, uh, but staggeringly nearly double that in military expenditure growth. Um, uh, and that just it seems to me to be well in excess of what uh, a a nation might might spend if it was defensively minded. So I just wonder what your thoughts are on China's emerging or developing military strategic objectives are. I, I see. So um, okay. <clears throat> so the, the, so if you read their uh, white paper twenty nineteen. Uh, so basically, their national security strategy, they are arguing that um, the, the, their military assets are very much for um, uh, domestic uh, purposes. Uh, if you, uh, they got different theaters, China is big, so they got different theaters, so the, these assets are aimed to protect those theaters, but I would include in those theaters uh, the South China Sea, which China increasingly considers as, as, as domestic, the, if you remember the, the nine uh, dotted uh, lines. Um, yes, it's, uh, I think China has no choice. So th th I think this is about great power. So China has no choice. It, it has to grow uh, militarily. So I think they will grow militarily. Um, the Belt Road Initiative and their global trade needs to be uh, protected somehow. At the moment, they are doing it with private armies. But China doesn't have allies, so it cannot do what the US does, what the US has done for, for many decades. So I think uh, they will have to, to expand more and more. I don't think, I don't think they have a choice. Uh, I think they are very careful with that because how they expand is uh, it's crucial. It can it can change the perception of of other countries. And as I was saying earlier on, if they were if if they were taking any aggressive initiative in the South China Sea, there would be retaliation. So I think they will do it. They will again. They will play a long game here. They will have to do it uh, in a very uh, smart way. Um, team, as you as you have noticed, uh, we um, we have a pretty um, a pretty fair amount of people from different parts of the world, right? So I mean, we have the Middle East, we have Africa, we have Europe, uh, we have uh, uh, South America. Uh, I actually do have a question for you. So, so, based on this discussion, how is your country or your company seeing this thing? For instance, um, Jonathan's from uh, from brazil like if you um do you do you have an idea of how the i don't know like maybe the brazilian navy is seeing uh, uh all this big geopolitical tension between uh, the us and and china uh alessio sabatini uh, i could ask you the very same question right so or or, or literally like uh anyone like if you if you uh if you have something to share you know we're definitely more than interested right zeno I mean, like, you know, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I just mean as, as I was saying earlier on, this, this, is, this competition is something that has ramifications that are worldwide and they concern every country in, in different ways. So absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, if uh, uh, someone uh, like uh, I would be very uh, interested to hear, uh, I don't know, like some of your uh, opinions, uh, for instance, but, uh, but literally anyone is uh, invited. So I mean, if you have something to share, Please just shoot. I mean, go go ahead. For 
instance, uh, uh, Jonas, can you hear me? Oh, of course, I can hear you. Uh, hi, Zeno. Hi, Mickey. Jonas, hi. Hey, uh, thank you for your presentation. Lovely. <laughs> uh, regarding your question, uh, I don't have uh, uh, formed opinion to present you now, but because Brazil is facing some political problem now, and regarding my Navy, uh, we, in our uh, national strategy, we foresee uh, a strategic surround that we are worried about. Can you understand me? Yeah. Yeah. Strategic, strategic area. And we are not uh, concerned about South China Sea specifically because we are uh, more interest, interest, interested in the Guinea, Gulf of Guinea, Guinea. And problems or uh, on that area could you understand me yeah yeah uh, yes i think uh, i think we don't talk enough about um uh, what's going on in africa um we always seem to think that africa is somehow um it is not there as a geopolitical actor but actually specifically when when we talk about competition between the us and china I mean, all, all begins from there in a way, because that's where the resources that we use in our everyday life uh, are. And, and China specifically needs that more and more. Um, so I, I think we should include that uh, more in the future. Uh, and in fact, I would like to, to include uh, Africa at some point in one of these presentations or uh, in some future publication, how the two states China and the U.S. compete in Africa. Yes, I could understand, but uh, it should be my question for you in this uh, webinar. Uh, because I see uh, we are not focused on in the problem between China and the USA. Because my question would be, uh, should be China uh, a threat or an opportunity for other countries? Uh, because last last year, in my course in the UK, I I had heard a lot about uh, Russia, Russia, Russia. Yeah. For, for yeah. example, Russia uh, is considered a threat for the UK. For yeah. example, yes. But I don't know about China. But China would be an opportunity it not a threat for the uh, the other countries in the region I, I mean I, I think as everything it's all relative and having studied uh, the American perspective having read what are they concerned what they think if you look at the statements from Trump Obama uh, their inner circle the world um, the, the, repre the US representative at the world trade they see China as a threat and to me from their point of view, that makes a lot of sense because uh, if, if their industries, if essentially what I banally call the Silicon Valley, loses its international primacy, then there will be a knock-on effect on, on American prestige and power. And so um, they see it as, as an economic threat, and I, I agree with that. Although, obviously, seeing somebody as an economic threat doesn't necessarily mean going to war with them doesn't necessarily mean acting as Trump does. But I, 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 see, I, see, I see what's their point of view. But otherwise, it's, it's all relative, um, really. I think something that uh, Western countries could improve in their relationship with China or, with China or should improve is uh, with regard to the, to the respect of uh, what used to be called ISO, International uh, Standards, organization. Um, 
I think that the European Union has a, had a strategy, a China strategy based on that since 1995. It's, it's published online, you can read it. I don't think they really enforced that. I think that it was, it was easy, it was, it was better to, to let any, any kind of investment coming in. Uh, but then, you know, you, you need to screen every investment, regardless of where it comes from. You cannot accept uh, anything. Um, I, always, I always make this example of about, um, uh, well, it, sorry, it, it's, it's too long to summarize now, but I really, I really invite you to, to recommend you to, to watch um, American Factory on Netflix, because you really see this tension about Chinese investments. A, a very poor territory in Ohio, in the United States, where, where there is a lot of unemployment because General Motors uh, has closed down. Uh, a Chinese businessman comes in, he wants to open a factory, but he wants to pay half of the salary to, to, its, to, to, to workers there. So what do we do? So I guess that's where, we need, that's where we need some kind of strategy in order to allow other people to come in and invest, but at the same time, uh, make sure that certain uh, labor and environmental standards are are respected. I think that's a healthy way of uh, fighting with other countries. If, if you see what I mean, that's 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 a productive way of of dealing with with a country who who you think is is damaging you. Sorry, my my answer went all over the place, but I, I, I see it as, I think the main issue is an economic issue. That's where uh, the whole problems with China starts. Uh, listen, Zeno, uh, we, we also have a question from Ahmed from uh, uh, Bahrain. Uh, Ahmed, if, you, uh, if you're there, just go, just go ahead uh, and ask Zeno what you wrote. Then we also have a, follow, a very interesting follow-up question by Mike also. Yes. Uh, yeah, hi. Good evening, uh, everyone. Um, when, when we talk about geopolitical uh, competition, and specifically in the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, Asia-Pacific region, what comes into my mind is that these are territories, uh, given the history, Chinese actually uh, think of as, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the U.S. pushing into territories where originally it was owned by the Chinese. So... They're going to act in an aggressive, defensive uh, way uh, just to protect their uh, territory. Yeah. And this is, this, is what, this is what comes into uh, my mind when I you know, hear Indo-Pacific and Asia-Pacific uh, territories. However, on the other hand, uh, for the U.S., these are um, main routes or uh, lines of trade that the U.S. wouldn't sacrifice and want to control to uh, you know, keep in yeah. touch with their allies, uh, whether it's trade or military yeah. purposes. Um, on the other hand, the Chinese, and I, I think that's uh, a smart move, what they did is they moved into territories where uh, Africa, South America, Europe, um, trying to push back the fight and or move the fight away from that, those territories and um, you know, act uh, to push the fight and competition away from their borders. Yeah. What do you think? What's your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it, it's, it's really difficult. But, so I think with regard to the historical point, uh, this year we have taught for the first time at the Defense Academy a course on China. Uh, it was with HCSC. And the very first uh, thing that, I, that, I've, that I've done, that I've studied with uh, my students was uh, the center of humiliation. So I think whether you like China or not, whether you want to fight China or be friends with China, I think it's always from a strategic point of view, from a point of view of a strategy maker, it's always good to, to understand uh, how, how people, how elites uh, understand their history, uh, what, what happened during uh, the period of Western imperialism. It's also important to understand that uh, those disputed islands in the South China Sea nowadays might have been um, already Chinese, or, or maybe not. We are not sure about that. But they, they, there is a possibility that they could have been Chinese. 
uh, 60 years ago, they could have become Chinese or 100 years ago. Um, so I, I think that I think it's fair to take that into account. <clears throat> also, we need to take into account that power matters in international relations. So if China is very powerful in the South China Sea, uh, it, it would be unwise not to take that into account. Uh, on the, from the US point of view, uh, we will see some, some debate about that because I, I, was, I was reading uh, Foreign Affairs uh, issue uh, April 2020. Uh, Foreign Affairs, as you know, it's a good, uh, gives you a good representation of what uh, the Council on Foreign Relations uh, thinks in the United States. And there were, uh, there were prominent authors, among which Graham Allison, arguing that the United States should acknowledge to an extent a, a Chinese sphere of influence there. Uh, in particular, they, when they were proposing different ways of, um, of using US allies in the region uh, in order to, to, to monitor China, uh, coming to, uh, and, while, and while acknowledging that sphere of influence, Coming, coming to an agreement, to a solid agreement with regard to uh, the security of Taiwan. Th this was one of the arguments that was going on in this debate. Um, so I wonder whether if we consider history, if we consider that China is powerful, and if we consider that the United States uh, may not be willing to, to fight to the teeth there, uh, it might be, we might see more people uh, claiming that it is wise to come to some kind, of, some kind of compromise. I don't want to use the word appeasement because I used this word, the word appeasement once at a conference and that's where somebody started to tell me that uh, I was a, a, a spy. I was, I was being paid uh, about 20,000 uh, pounds by the Chinese Communist Party. So I will not use that, but there are people who are thinking to some, at some kind of compromise and I think what we've seen with, uh, this has nothing to do, but what we've seen with Huawei in Britain, that was a big compromise, right? Because they, they accepted Huawei, but only uh, in certain parts of the British network. That kind of approach, that kind of method might be the way forward, whether it's Huawei, whether it's geopolitical issues, whether it's the WTO, it, it will be probably some future strategies towards China will look probably as some, something like that that kind of compromise. That, that's my opinion. Uh, so listen, Zeno, we, um, uh, we had a follow-up question from Mike uh, and yes. then uh, Alessio Sabatini also yes. uh, shared uh, uh, a very interesting comment. Uh, yes. So please, Mike, uh, yeah. go, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Can, can I for, first, before we close, take the chance to, to thank everyone, but also in particular to say hi to uh, students and colleagues and whoever is based at uh, the Defense Academy, who is at the moment listening to this webinar. And th thanks again, it's, it's nice to see you here. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Hi, um, it's just a follow up to Paul's question. When you look back throughout history and the rise of other empires or hegemons, and you're thinking perhaps um, recently the United Kingdom in Great Britain and then the US, is China's rise actually perhaps the most peaceful we've actually seen, and deliberately so? And given that, should we be actually concerned about this, or is China's military spending just part of a natural evolution as its economic power rises? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, if, if, we, if you read, uh, there is a very interesting book by Giovanni Arrighi, it's called uh, Adam Smith in Beijing, so it's about China becoming a capitalist country, and he refers to a 500 years uh, peace uh, in Asia and 300 years peace, particularly with regard uh, to China, that happened uh, from uh, the, 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 sorry, the, 16th, the beginning of the 16th, I'm counting from the beginning of the 16th century onward. And he's, say, he's saying, while Europe was, you know, in, in Europe we had a lot of wars, um, Asia and China were enjoying some kind of, some kind of systemic in, intra-regional uh, peace. Uh, that, that, that's important. Uh, to this, I would like to add that uh, 
We know by we know that the narrative of the Belt Road Initiative is it's framed through the lenses of uh, what they call Tiangsha, which is a a very uh, peaceful uh, ideology of gun strategy, if you want. So essentially, Chan is saying uh, we we don't want to um, so we, we we don't want to be an empire. We we just want to be in harmony with with every other country. We just want to do uh, trade. Uh, on the other hand, my, my sense is that even if China didn't want to be uh, aggressive, uh, the fact that China is becoming so competitive is, is upsetting uh, other, not only the United States, is, is upsetting other countries. And so, uh, as we know, we, the military muscles, as, uh, we always see battle for rules in, within the World Trade Organization with, when, when countries make trade agreements, but military muscles are very important in order to, uh, you know, to sit at the table and, and, and speak with authority, speak with, um, with, with a strong uh, voice. And so I guess China, China, will, need, China need, will need those uh, military muscles uh, for sure, especially because they are very mindful, as you said, Mike, about uh, Western imperialism. So in their narratives, they, they got different narratives about the international order. But generally speaking, in, in, none, of, in none of these narratives, you see a, they, don't really, they don't trust the West uh, completely based on history. And, and I think this, this is an important point. Thank you very much. Thanks. I think there was a question from Alessio. Yes, hello everyone. Hello Zeno. Thank you for your presentation. And um, I just would like to uh, let my comment that I wrote on the chat. So I personally worked in, in, in within um, a counter piracy operation of the coast of Somalia. And so I, uh, I saw uh, working Chinese with Chinese big, big chips uh, over there and, um, and reflecting in a way they are acting uh, in a political way. They like do things and stuff literally alone. So we were there um, with Europeans, we were there. Uh, facing the piracy phenomenon in the, where, um, uh, under the NATO shield, actually, but they worked alone. And uh, as you said, where, where the Chinese naval base in Djibouti and uh, uh, the logistic support there now, I think that uh, they have gained with the Pakistan border port and uh, all the other uh, facilities that are investing on uh, along the string of pearls, as you mentioned, I just thinking about uh, um, they they really need to protect their their commerce, um, the sea line of communication, and so I expecting that uh, even for the military part, uh, it needs to grow and uh, in accordance with the, their global global commerce. I think. Uh, yes, yes, I, I, I totally agree. Um, even though I have, I have colleagues arguing that interdependence um, with the United States will, will, lead to, uh, will not lead to war, but actually will, be, will lead to some sort of uh, G2, uh, some sort of global diarchy. Uh, pe personally, I struggle to see it, uh, but... Um, I think it's fair to, to mention that, especially because nowadays we have been talking a lot about competition, but let's not forget that um, we, ha we haven't seen a conflict yet, yet between uh, the US and China. And this is because there are uh, very important uh, commercial interests uh, between the two countries and between China and the West. And, and this will be, a, a, this is a fundamental point in terms of um, avoiding uh, future conflicts. I think everyone will think uh, twice. Uh, there is an interesting vignette from uh, Edward Lutwak, which is a very famous um, uh, Romanian-American uh, strategist. Who he often uh, appears on Italian TV. Uh, he wrote a book about US-China relations and he's talking about 
three different US foreign policies towards China, a foreign policy of the Treasury, a foreign policy of the, uh, the Defense Department, and a foreign policy of uh, the, the State Department. Uh, depending on which department we look at, we see a different uh, relationship. As you can imagine, the Defense Department is more uh, confrontational, while the Treasury is more keen on uh, engaging and cooperating uh, with China. Uh, this, has, this is leading in every country to big, big debate. There are big debates at the moment between uh, uh, strategists, economists, um, and so I, uh, I can't predict which line, which foreign policy uh, will, uh, will win. But we need to be aware that uh, cooperation is also an option in the future. It's, I, I didn't want to give you uh, the idea that uh, we, we are uh, fast forward, uh, we're moving uh, uh, towards a, a conflict. Uh, it is very difficult to predict, I have to say. Uh, are there any other questions or comments uh, before we say uh, bye to each other, at least for the day? All right. So listen, uh, uh, thank you very much, everyone. As Zeno was saying, uh, thank you so much for showing up. Uh, uh, huge, uh, huge thanks uh, to uh, our, our students, uh, colleagues, uh, people from the Defense Academy, but also uh, guests from all over the world, students from uh, Italy, from elsewhere. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Leone. Thank you, Zeno, for this very, very Thanks. good... Th Thanks, uh, Michele, for, for moderating. Uh, ...presentation. Uh, let me just remind uh, that we have the webinar tomorrow. I will be presenting the major counterterrorism dilemmas. Uh, hopefully, we're going to see you there. Uh, regardless, Zen and I are going to be putting this online and uh, uh, we can still be in touch. Thank you very much, everyone, and have an awesome night. Th thank you, everyone, and thanks, Michele. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, all.